Thank you very much for the introduction. This was a great session and uh, probably could have listened to you guys, the patients, and thought about the nuances of living with disease, having to get it treated um, probably for the whole day. Um, so thank you, and it's, uh, we were talking in the back, it's a tough act to follow. So I I'll do my best. To some extent, I'm a bit of a technician, but hopefully that's important as well. And I do want to thank KDGO in the sense that KDGO has come a long way. It's been helpful to me in my career. Hopefully I've been helpful to KDGO. And we're really in a different place, right? I, I think first we had to get kidney disease on the map and the definition and staging, and people here have been seminal to that. And now bringing it together with cardiology, where the cardiology organizations are writing in a big way about kidney disease and thinking about coming as a population problem is exciting, but daunting. Uh, and speaking of which, I have now moved institutions, so I'm a kid again trying to do optimal aging, which connects to all of these issues of how we do things with meaning and yet take care of the technical aspects. So I'll talk to you about technical aspects of uh, prediction of uh, heart failure. And I'll start my clock since I know we're late, but somehow I've been told we'll be okay. Uh, so prediction of heart failure. Uh, background, talk about staging and risk prediction, cardiovascular risk prediction, and then future directions. The future is kind of here, but there's more to do, and we, I already heard that we need to do more. But I think the AHA prevent risk calculator and the AHA movement in the CKMH uh, initiative, it's a good time to come together about that. So in a way, emphasizing where we are as much as what we need to do is important. So you all know this, CGA, cause, there's lots more to do, as I look at Adira. GNA, I think we've come a long way. There's a lot more to be said for cystatin testing to complement creatinine testing. So that's a staging. Today's talk is really about prediction, which is individualizing the estimates from a multivariate model. This is a great article by Andy Morgan and Leslie that I think lays out a lot of the principles that maybe many of you know, but applies them really well with a kidney failure risk equation being a key component, works really well for low GFR. Importantly, we really all want to get to prevention as well, in addition to treatment. Uh, and CKD progression, the calculator that's been published now a couple of years ago, looking at 40% decline and providing the opportunity for early prevention. I'll talk about that more. And then today's focus on cardiovascular disease, pooled cohort equation and score in Europe were there before. We'll talk about prevent. And importantly, Asia has the majority of people in the world, and yet uh, we're lagging in our equations. A apologies. I'm not fixing it today. Uh, <laughs> but maybe, you know, we work hard. Uh, this is a diagram. I like this version. Morgan likes the other version, right? It's inspired by some of the idea of each arrow is where you start and what you're predicting. And the idea is that it's not just one thing. You start early in kidney disease. You start late in kidney disease. So the kidney failure risk equation is useful here, but the 40% decline is useful throughout here. And then cardiovascular disease sort of goes around kidney disease and with kidney disease. So we'll talk about that as well. So heart failure as a risk factor, first predicting CKD. So this is sort of the opposite, this little red arrow going backwards. I'll focus most of the talk about CKD predicting heart failure, but we know it's circular. I'm going to focus on this outcome of 40% decline in EGFR because I think it needs to be used a lot more. I hope you're using it already. If not, we need to get it more widely used. It's earlier and more common than kidney failure. KFRE does not work for GFR greater than 60. This is sort of one of four equations, so we need computers, you know, we're not going to just memorize all these coefficients. But to talk about them, higher age is a risk factor for progression, but is not for dialysis in many cases once you get older, right? So it's different to talk about progression and dialysis. It's not the same equation. EGFR at baseline is the dominant risk factor for dialysis, but not for progression for a 40% decline. Uh, which is an important distinction, and albuminuria is the preventable risk factor, and we've talked about the fact that it's time. It's well over time. We've talked about it 20 years ago, but it's never too late. Uh, 
history of heart failure is a 2.87 relative hazard. So clearly, this connection, that's part of why we're here, but we can prevent progression. So heart failure clearly predicts future progression of kidney disease. CHD does as well, AFib, smoking, et cetera. So this is an equation, and many of the variables are shared, so it's really shared treatment, and the integrative uh, clinica models were really inspirational and super important. This also, this table is just for no diabetes, high GFR, works similarly in diabetes, works similarly in low GFR with hazard ratios of 1.6. So now switching to the other side, looking at kidney disease as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, complicated by the fact that kidney disease aggravates things like hypertension, things like hypertension and diabetes aggravate kidney disease, so really it's a triangle of causes. So multivariable equations are recommended by the guidelines, um, and we've got SCORE2 mainly used in Europe, and we have an add-on for that for kidney disease. The pooled cord equation was used in the U.S., and the idea was to get beyond the limitations. Limitations where heart failure were excluded and black-white rate specific, which people are worried about removing it, but there are so many people as to, first of all, classifying people isn't great. Second of all, many of us don't fall into these categories, right? Uh, older data and limited geography. So we wanted to do a new equation to overcome all of that and add new variables that I'll talk about. Sadia Khan and this work group really worked on this with the CKD Prognosis Consortium. The calculator is online. You have the, the location. And there's a companion paper that talks about risk prediction, which I think many of you have looked at. These are long papers. Thank you for trying to struggle through them. Uh, the implementation uh, rate will be important. So, you know, I'm looking at some of you integrating them into EPIC and getting them to clinical decision support tools that are support, not someone mentioned like a hostage taker that won't let you go home until you click the last button. Uh, so what's in this equation, right? So there's too much to go over, but the idea was to do total cardiovascular disease, but also atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which in the appendix is broken down into CHD and stroke separately and heart failure. So there's four outcomes to begin with, times male and female, so that's times two, right? And then there's other variations times four variations. So again, you're gonna need a computer. But it makes sense, looking at heart failure, right? Elevated blood pressure is important, above 110. Below 110, it's a bit of a U-shape, so we took care of that. Diabetes is clearly a very strong risk factor, and we need to talk about primary prevention and management. And now we've got great drugs for both, and the obesity drugs in addition to that in terms of primordial prevention. Smoking is a risk factor. BMI above 30 is a risk factor. Again, a U-shaped relationship, so a little tricky. And low GFR is a risk factor. Again, not the same. So we have a spline for less than 60 and a flat association above 60. Uh, and this is with creatinine. We think with cystatin, the association is similar, but we didn't build that equation. Then it's nice we added more variables, right? So the new variables, in addition to GFR, we're looking at albuminuria, and it's a consistent risk factor for all the subtypes, including heart failure risk, right? So it's going to be important, I think, to look at that. It's a great risk stratifier that I think cardiology can really integrate, and general medicine as well. Uh, hemoglobin A1C, because if you're going to have diabetes, it matters how the control is, and that's clearly a risk factor. And then social deprivation index, in addition to that as a risk factor, this was built on zip codes for the U.S. So this calculator, with apologies, was tailor-made to the U.S., right? We need to think globally, and I guess KDGO is the right thing, and uh, I am now realizing we should do more and better. But we've also tried to integrate into the dominant forces in each place, right? So if Europe wants to use SCORE, we've built a patch to add kidney. Right? It's an interesting question of what does Asia, which is not one thing, want to do. Uh, but that's the beauty of KDGO. Um, so in terms of uh, validation, I think we did our best, right? So we had a derivation sample of 3 million people, uh, a validation sample of 3 million people. It had 21 cohorts for the validation, and basically, uh, you know, three of them, Regards, Crick, and Rancho Bernardo, are individual and are here in different colors, red, orange, and green. 
and the other uh, 18 are different health systems within the Optin Laboratory Data Warehouse in the US. And you can see that overall they calibrate quite well. You're supposed to align to this diagonal one of observed equals predicted. There are differences between health systems. Uh, I agree with the idea that we should have more validation in different health systems and different countries implemented by specific people, hopefully actually implementing it into their health system and using the variables in the health system, not just things because people shouldn't do this in their head. But generally, saying that it wasn't validated, uh, you know, it's only three million people's worth of validation. So, you know, I think it was validated. It wasn't validated by other people. Um, the prevent model discrimination and calibration is quite good, and heart failure is impressive. You know, AUC of 0 0.83 in women and 0 0.809 in men. Overall, good and good in subgroups, right? So importantly, even though race is not in the model, it's well calibrated in white and black individuals. Actually, Asian Americans may have a different risk somewhat, so the calibration getting it just right. On the other hand, I showed you that on average you can get calibration right, but there are differences between Baltimore and Baltimore. So how can you expect it to be the same in Baltimore and Seattle and San Francisco, right? So I think this idea, these global equations are global, and then there could be local adaption, but the big factors are actionable, so I think that's useful. Um, there's slightly improved discrimination versus the pooled cord equation. Nothing to write home about, you know, 0 0.01, a little less. But we add more with the equation. We add a little more with EGFR. We add a little more with ACR. We add a little more with AZ1C. We add a little more with SDI. And the calibration is dramatically better and heart failure is in. So I think we've moved forward quite a bit. Um, and indeed, the calibration for ASCVD by the pooled cord equation was off it was by about two times greater than the observed ASCVD risk, right? So those were 30-year-old estimates. So on the other hand, the funny and ironic but maybe helpful thing is that if the pooled cord equation was two, twice as high for ASCVD and ASCVD, you add heart failure, was about half of total CVD, the new predictions aren't so far off from the old prediction, but it's a different outcome with better calibration for contemporary rates. Right, so at least, but it may be a little less confusing because people could come out with the same global risks. So the article shows the key takeaways. I won't read them all to you. Heart failure is included. EGFR and albuminuria are included in optional models. So you don't require albuminuria. There was a lot of conversation with the AHA and Sadia was wonderful in guiding me to not do stupid things. I need a lot of help to not do stupid things. But with help, eventually I, I do okay. Uh, you know, and I think together the, the AHA did a great job. The idea is, you know, to inform clinical practice guideline, I think this diagram is very helpful, right? Higher predicted absolute risk often identifies the greater treatment benefit because the absolute risk times the relative risk reduction is the attributable relative risk, which really underlines a lot of Brendan's beautiful talk. What's to come, we need to look at net benefit in trials, equity evaluation, you know, look at using it in actual guidelines and looking at it specifically, integration into EMRs, clinical decision supports, you know, how to put it into EPIC thoughtfully, heart failure risk prediction is available now. So now a few slides about sort of the next step. Right? So there's always limitations to what we've done. The big thing is this was traditional risk factors and people without CVD. So what if we add NT, pro BNP, and troponin, do we gain? And we worked with, uh, with uh, Nisha Bansal and others to start doing this as preliminary work for this uh, meeting, right? So we've analyzed five cohorts and the hazard ratio per twofold higher NT pro BNP, you can see was statistically significant in every single cohort. Two of them are CKD cohorts, three of them are general population cohorts. So it's likely to be true supporting an existing literature. The delta C statistics ranges from 0.016 to 0.065, which is actually quite high. You know, talking to some of you, if the risk is already high, then maybe you don't need it even if it adds more. On the other hand, if the risk is intermediate, maybe that's the place to do it. And I think this group as to where it will be useful is going to be an interesting conversation. The results work adjusted for the risk factors or the prevent risk scores. They work both ways. Uh, troponin 
on top of NT pro B and P only added 0.004. So maybe we don't need both necessarily. Um, there were no consistent interactions, which was quite interesting by age, sex, BMI, a little bit weaker in diabetes, pretty much the same in low GFR as high GFR. So despite the fact, and pretty much the same with albuminuria, right? This is despite the fact that levels of NT pro BNP are clearly higher at low GFR, right? And this is, levels are also higher in the dashed lines with CHD stroke than no CHD stroke. So whether absolute cutoffs will work is something that I don't fully know, and it's a useful point for conversation. So clearly, undeniably, we know what makes levels higher. What's interesting is, what if you chose a cutoff anyways and just said, oh, we looked at the literature, we talked to Nisha, let's choose 125. What's the relative hazard? It turns out in these five cohorts, it was surprisingly working, right? So there's a relative hazard of about 2.29 and it's true in every cohort, a little bit more, a little bit less. So this incremental use, when needed, may actually work. I'd love to hear from the group how, when, where. Uh, the delta C statistics for just the cutoff is about 0.02, which is not small. And then in conclusion, basically the background is CKD staging and risk prediction. We have lots of equations for nckdpcrisk.org and other websites are well developed with multiple tools. Cardiovascular risk prediction, I think there's an advance. We need to sort of integrate it. And in terms of future direction, the NT pro BNP seems to be quite useful as suggested for a number of years now. There are clearly some differences in calibration and those exist even more for troponin and the different troponin assays and could be used to identify patients who benefit from early treatment of heart failure risk factors. So this would be interesting to know the clinical niche. So finally, uh, thank you to uh, you for listening, KDGO and NKF for the invitation and the support, the steering committee and the members of CKD Prognosis Consortium, CKD Epi collaborators on estimated GFR for a long time and everybody who does a lot of this work that I collaborate with.